Testing, testing, testing. Testing on YouTube. YouTube seems to be working. Awesome. All right, so now let's get X working. should be live soon we just need to wait and we're good to go How's it going? Nuno Peixoto. How's it going, Josh? How's everybody's uh, new year? Is it already better or already worse than 2023? Welcome back. I appreciate it. Thanks. It's kind of chilly in here. That's why I'm wearing my hoodie. All right, should be starting here any second. Okay, I think we're live on X, let's see. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's get this thing started. All right, welcome to the first Hoopo stream of 2024. Hope everybody had a good break. So today we're going to be uh, looking at some vision language models, specifically some smaller vision language models. And uh, the stream is called Tiny GPT 5 and then Mobile VLM, or I think this is GPT V, my bad, GPT Vision. So you can find uh, all the links that I'm going to be uh, looking at on this GitHub page. So the first paper we're going to look at is Mobile VLM, Fast, Strong, and Open Vision Language Assistant for Mobile Devices, 30th of December 2023, so just, uh, I guess, less than a week ago. And this is work out of Meituan, Zhejiang, and Dalian University, so some academic groups and then a uh, little startup. So let's go ahead and read the actually before we go ahead let's why don't we introduce the other paper and then maybe do a little bit of motivation how's it going majetti gizzle mh so the other paper we'll be reading today is tiny gpt v efficient multimodal large language model via small backbones also relatively recent also coming out of uh, a couple different academic institutions um but i wanted to motivate this with uh, a paper that's not we're not going to review today because it's not that amazing of a paper, but this paper here, GPT-4 Vision is a generalist web agent if grounded. So this is a paper from Ohio State University just released a couple of days ago. And in this paper, they basically take GPT-4 Vision. So I don't know why GPT-V, like V is the Roman numeral 5. 
but for some reason they they decided that GPTV means GPT Vision. I don't know. It's a terrible name if you ask me, but basically it's a vision language model, right? So a, a model that can understand both images and language. Uh, and in this paper, they use it to basically accomplish tasks on a screen or like a browser, right? So you can envision that what the language model sees is basically the actual uh, browser screen, which is just a 2D image, and then it has some text instructions such as uh, move the cursor to find your truck and click on it, right? And as I said, there's not like, this paper isn't that amazing, you know, it's, it's still kind of primitive, but we're getting pretty close, right? And I think if you can project this type of performance out another year, I think it's not, we're really only probably less than a year out from a vision language model uh, combined with an agent of some sort that can basically interact with a computer in the same way that you interact with a computer. And that means that it can effectively end up doing pretty much anything that a human does, but it's an AI, right? So right now, one of the things that's limiting these uh, types of agents and visual agents that can kind of do things like this is that they're a little bit expensive, right? So running GPT-4 vision, running language models, or any of these vision language models, you you kind of need uh, amount of inference that is not insignificant, right? Most people, including myself, for example, some of my robotics projects, I use it through an API, which means that I'm not even running it on the GPUs that I have at home. I'm running it on some GPU in a data center. But in the combination with these papers here, which are the ones that we're going to be reviewing today, we're starting to see kind of the miniaturization of these vision language models to the point that you can run them on a cell phone, right? So I think the combination of vision language model agents that can basically interact with the 2D kind of world of the internet that can also run on something like a cell phone, I think if you combine those two things, right, that's extremely powerful uh, force, right? You basically have decentralized bots that aren't running on some APIs, so you can't really control them, and it's also very difficult to tell if they're human, so I don't know. We're, we're moving into into an interesting world, and I think the kind of combination of the just how good and how general these vision language models are, specifically on uh, kind of tasks like this, which I think is like 80% of what humans do in front of a computer is pretty much going to be possible soon enough. How's it going, Yan, and how's it going, Wu Li? So going back to the two papers that we're looking at today, this is the better one of the two, so I reviewed these papers a little bit before this stream just to be a little bit more prepared. This paper is not as good, this tiny GBTV. This one is better, so we're going to be spending more time on this one here, but they're both very similar. Basically, what they do is they... Uh, it's kind of like a bag of tricks paper where they just have a bunch of different tricks and tips and techniques and ablation studies about uh, what they did in order to actually get this VLM to fit on a small compute package. How's it going? Spirebell. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with this abstract. We present Mobile VLM, a competent multimodal vision language model. This uh, competent here literally means nothing. <laughs> There's no formal definition for that. Multimodal uh, again, because it's using both modalities, the modality of vision and the modality of language. Uh, MMVLM, terrible name. I think usually I kind of like calling these just VLMs. I think that's a clean name for them. Targeted to run on mobile devices. It is an amalgamation of a myriad of architectural designs and techniques that are mobile-oriented, which comprise of a set of language models at the scale of 1.4B and 2.7B parameters. So this is pretty small, right? So... For example, Mistral or the smallest version of Llama, those are 7 billion parameter models, and those are already kind of advertised as pretty small models, but now we're talking about 1 billion, so like one, almost one-tenth the size of that. So this is really kind of the smallest of the small models here. Trained from scratch, and this isn't entirely true, so they're kind of embellishing this a little bit. We'll, we'll see why it's not entirely trained from scratch, but uh, in some ways it's trained from scratch. A multimodal vision model that is pre-trained in the CLIP fashion. So CLIP is a contrastively trained, uh, contrastive language image pre-training. But it's kind of the way that they're saying this is, is kind of like an umbrella term for just contrastive training, 
contrastive learning, which is a, a type of uh, way to push gradients into a neural net and then have it learn some kind of representation that ends up being useful for something. Cross-modality interaction via an efficient projector. Here they're talking about the cross-attention that's going to be happening between the uh, vision or visual information, vision tokens, and then the language information or language tokens. And this efficient projector is going to be kind of the little glue that connects the vision encoder and the uh, language encoder or backbone. So in this paper you see this small backbones. The backbones are basically the encoders. Uh, we evaluate mobile VLM on several typical VLM benchmarks. Our models demonstrate on par performance compared with a few much larger models. More importantly, we measure the inference speed on a Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 CPU, which this is like a cell phone, I think. I think it, I think the Qualcomm chips are also the chips that are in the VR headset, specifically the, the Meta Quest headsets. I think they also have Qualcomm chips. I don't know if it's the exact Snapdragon, but I'm not up to date on all my Qualcomm chips. And then the NVIDIA Jetson Orin, this is kind of one of the edge computing, kind of like robotics themed uh, GPU devices that NVIDIA sells. Think like, a, think like a Raspberry Pi, but kind of like souped up and with a little GPU on it. And we obtain a state-of-the-art performance of 21.5 tokens and 63, 65.3 tokens respectively per second. I mean, the state-of-the-art here doesn't necessarily mean anything as well, you know, like they're not doing an exhaustive evaluation of all possible models they're kind of just they're going to pick one thing that they're better at and then they're going to just claim state-of-the-art on that so that is mobile vlm uh, okay so nuno does know he says that the uh qualcomm chip in the quest is the snapdragon xr gen 2 so i don't know if that's less strong or more strong than the snapdragon but you know what, why don't we answer that? Here I have perplexity. Is the Qualcomm, or is the Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 better or worse than the Snapdragon 888? So this is perplexity, which, People were hyping this up, so I kind of joined the hype train, see what it's about, and it's all right. You know, I kind of like it. Wow, it already failed, but <laughs> it's not good, this one. No. All right. Well, that's not going to work, so rather than type that question again, we'll just never go to that ever again, and I'm going to unsubscribe from that. Okay. So we have some introduction here. They're just kind of talking about how, oh, remarkable performance. You have GPT-4 Vision. You have Gemini, which is Google's uh, kind of vision language model, but these are very limited technical details. You know, they're very secretive, so we don't really know what the fuck is going on. And uh, they're comparing to some earlier kind of works. Flamingo is quite dated at this point. I think it's like pre-2020. And then you have Blip2, which is, uh, we're gonna actually be looking at Blip2 because both of these papers use this uh, Q-former pattern that ends up being kind of a way to do it. Uh, Lava, which we've looked at. What else? They're kind of scrolling through here. Lava may be the first attempt to replicate the instruction tuning paradigm from LLMs. So instruction tuning is this idea that you can separate training into multiple phases, right? You have your pre-training phase, which is where you're kind of just feeding a ton of text data into a language model. And just trying to get it to learn a pretty good kind of next token uh, prediction model, right? So it just gets good at predicting the next token. It's kind of like a, you can think of it like a kind of general world model. And then once you actually go into this instruction tuning, that's where you take the kind of generic uh, language model that's just really good at predicting the next token and trying to tune it into this kind of chat assistant where it can follow kind of these back and forth conversations and pretend to be kind of an entity that has some amount of consciousness. And the way you do that is you have to basically now train it, but a, a smaller duration of training on a smaller data set with a smaller learning rate. And this is what the fine tuning or instruction tuning is. And that data set is going to basically be these kind of like conversations back and forth. Okay. And uh, you 
can do that for language models, but now you can also do that for vision language models, right? So the same idea is happening with these vision language models where you have a pre-training phase that's kind of more generic, more broad, and then you have this uh, instruction tuning where you actually have uh, smaller data sets of these conversations between uh, here's an image, here's the question that the user asks, here's the answer, right? So because that's the kind of format that you want for a product. Okay, so we have kind of the beginnings of instruction tuning, blah, 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 natural demand to enable cross-modality capacities and resource-constrained scenarios. Blah, 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 we aim to produce the first open mobile-scale VLM trained using public data sets and available techniques to achieve visual perception and reasoning customized for resource-constrained platforms. So resource-constrained platforms just means kind of edge devices like these two. <laughs> Yeah, I was quite excited to like use this today, you know, and I was using it earlier today to kind of ask some questions and I liked it, but I don't know about that. <laughs> what is the, oh, here we go. It saved it. Okay. What is the Snapdragon? What if I put Snapdragon? There we go. All right. Perplexity redeeming itself. <laughs> Both processors designed, uh, XR2 is an ARVR, and then the 888 video pass-through. So XR2 is probably stronger, I guess? No, 888 has faster CPU speed, but then the 888 has a higher GPU frequency, so that's kind of the, the speed, right? Like any... Whether it's the memory or the CPU or your GPU, there's kind of like a clock rate. Like you could think of it like it's a tiny little electrical heartbeat, right? And it's like beating really, really quickly. And whenever you're, for example, overclocking your CPU, you're basically increasing that that speed of that little electronic heartbeat. So it seems like the 888, which is the cell phone one, is probably running at a faster clock rate. It might even be the same underlying chip, and then they just run one slightly faster. With any of these uh, kind of like small processors like this, it kind of ends up, you're never really pushing the performance all the way to the end. You're kind of almost always limited by the, the thermal, right? So it's like how hot does it get, how quickly, and then also the power. So you don't want to be like draining. So I don't know. That's all I got for you on, on mobile chips. All right, so let's go to the bottom of the introduction section here where they're basically going to tell you the most important parts of their paper. We present Mobile VLM, a full-stack remake of multimodal vision language models tailored for mobile scenarios. We are the first to provide a detailed, reproducible, and strong vision language model from scratch. This is a strong uh, claim. I don't think that's the case. I feel like the Lava models that we looked at earlier were also fairly open, you know, like, I don't know. With controlled open source data sets, we build a set of high performance foundation models. We make extensive ablation studies on the design of visual encoders and systematically evaluate the performance. We design an efficient projector between the visual and text features. And this is kind of, I think the, the biggest kind of question mark right now, all of these vision language model papers right now, they're all kind of basically doing the same idea of having a frozen vision backbone and then a frozen text backbone and really most of the kind of hyperparameter search that the kind of community is going through is like how do you glue these things together and then how do you train uh, that specific little glue layer, right? So this projector is kind of the terminology that's emerging for the little piece that's connecting the vision encoder and the uh, mobile encoder or, and the uh, text encoder. Our models perform comparably on a large body of VLM benchmarks, attesting their potential in numerous tasks in practice. Although we mainly focus on edge scenarios, our model performs many recent VLMs, which can only be supported by powerful GPUs in the cloud. And and this is kind of, I think, the, the important paragraph for kind of where this is all going, right? And just imagine a world where uh, if you've ever seen those like kind of social engagement farms in like China where it's like a person who's sitting in front of like this desk that has like a hundred cell phones on it, right? And then basically you pay this person and they'll go and they'll use your app and you can say, hey, we have a hundred daily active users, but really it's just one person clicking on a hundred cell phones to make it look like there's a hundred daily active users, right? So 
imagine the kind of like turbo juiced version of that where now instead of like one person who has to attend to a hundred cell phones in front of them you have basically this like weird building in some random place in like Nigeria that has 10,000 cell phones in it and there's only one guy who takes care of all 10,000 of those cell phones and every single one of those cell phones is running a local vision language model that has a little agent on it that it has some specific goal and the goal is of course whatever you pay the guy who owns that warehouse to do and it's going to get very very difficult there's no amount of captchas that we're going to get to where eventually these things aren't going to be able to solve them so that's the world where we're headed okay related work vision transformers vision transformers also known as vits like this or vits sometimes the cool kids call it a vit i kind of like vit but it's basically a transformer architecture specifically for uh, vision. So I do have that pulled up. I've shown this many times before, but this is kind of the basic TLDR for how a vision transformer works. Uh, first step is to take your image and you cut it into these patches. So here you're cutting it into 3x3, three three, but generally it's something like 14x14 14 14, or even something like 32x32. 32 32. So you're cutting it into a bunch of these patches and then you're feeding in these patches in a sequence as if it was a sentence, right? So transformers are all about sequences, uh, which is something like a sentence, right? Like a bunch of uh, little things ordered in a specific, you can think of it like this. So in order to turn a image into a sequence, you basically cut it into these patches and then just feed it in as if it was a sentence. But because these are kind of unordered, right? Like now you've kind of lost the order, right? Like, yes, this is to the left of this, but you don't, like there's a jump here, right? Right here, it jumps from the very last thing to the very first thing. So in order to kind of keep some of that position information of like where exactly in the image is this part of the, uh, is this little patch corresponding to, you add these position embeddings, right? And there's lots of different types of position embeddings, but you're basically adding that so that the uh, encoder or the transformer block right here is aware of where in the image this little patch is, right? And a VIT is gonna be basically a bunch of these patches or a bunch of these transformer blocks just kind of stacked over and over again. That's what this LX is, right? Usually you'd have, I don't know, eight of these blocks stacked. And uh, the multi-head attention, this is gonna be whenever you're basically doing the self-attention between these and the th same things again, right? And self-attention or cross-attention if you have some other sequence that you're uh, doing that attention operation on. You have normalizations to make sure everything is nice and normalized and uh, doesn't rock the boat too much. And then you have this multi-layer perceptron here, which actually probably does a lot of the thinking. You know, this multi-layer perceptron, that's where you actually kind of project into some new embedding space that is more useful. Okay. What else? We got large language models, billions of parameters, pre-trained on extremely extensive text corpora. Eliver Group question. Have you ever come across random matrix theory? That's a pretty generic term. Let's see. New thread. What is random matrix theory? active research area with numerous applications, main goal of RMTs to provide an understanding of diverse properties, statistics of matrix eigenvalues of matrices with entries drawn randomly from various probability distributions. Okay, so the first thing that I think of whenever, whenever I see this is that there was a paper, and I think it was literally Andrew Ng, one of Andrew Ng's papers when he was a grad student, so it's like pretty ancient at this point, but he had a paper where he basically showed that uh, random ConvNets can actually be used uh, as classifiers. So you feed an image into a ConvNet that's been initialized to basically have random weights, and then you have a little MLP at the top of that, and you freeze that convolutional kind of backbone and encoder, and you can still, using that little MLP, learn relatively good classification model using basically what is just a bunch of random kernels and convolutions all together. So there's something to be said about kind of random matrices, but I think this is probably something more specific and more mathy. So long history. I don't know. Is there something specific, Elevé group that you want? 
something related to this. All right. Uh, LLMs like GPT. There's a trend to build smaller language models. GPT Neo, Pythia, Galactica, Open Llama, Phi, Quen, blah, blah, blah. Our target is to build reproducible and efficient models. Hence, we do not use any non public data for our research. And this is, like I said, this is a lie. And the way that it's a lie, maybe we can skip forward a little bit. So they, first of all, they use some pre trained models such as Clip VIT L14. So that's a question mark there. But uh, yeah, for example here, whenever they do the supervised fine-tuning for their language model, they use a multi-turn dialogue data set that has been generated by ChatGPT. Okay, so is that non-public data? I don't know what that is, you know? I think if you design a model and then you fine-tune it on GPT-4 responses, can OpenAI come and sue you for that? Right, in their terms of service, they can, because I think they have explicitly something in their term of service that says you can't use our model outputs to train your own model. So it's a little confusing. You know, there really isn't, it's kind of like the Wild West right now where everybody's training on everybody's outputs, but they literally use like GPT-4 uh, conversations or GPT-4 synthetic data, if you want to think of it that way, to train and fine tune their language model in this. So I don't know about their claim about not utilizing any non-public data. Okay. Uh, I think mostly what they're trying to say is that they tell you what data they use rather than uh, keeping it secret, but I still don't know if you're necessarily free from legal repercussions. Okay, architecture choices. VLMs are pre-trained open source models, visual backbones, typically vision transformers, pre-trained in various strategies. Uh, data centricness. Construction of training data has become increasingly crucial. It is common to utilize millions of text image pairs in the line of VLMs, right? So this is a lot of what these vision language models are trained with is basically these kind of like captioning data sets where it's like someone scraped the internet and then they have images and then there's some text associated with that image and it's just kind of assumed that the text is relevant to that image. There's still a lot of kind of data cleanliness issues that come up with that and there's another paper that we can look at today called Cosmo contrastively or contrastive streamlined multimodal model with interleaved pre-training. This is not a miniaturization model or a miniaturization paper. This is kind of a different thing. This is more just talking about how do you train vision language models in general, but uh, they do have an interesting part here where they talk about how uh, there's a lot of kind of issues with the corpuses or the data sets that people use to train these. So for example, CC3M, Leon 400 mil, and Datacomp 1B, which is these short image text pairs, right? Uh, web documents are noisy. The images on the same page might not be highly correlated. You know, sometimes you get, for example, uh, here they show you instances of low similarity images. So sometimes in these data sets, you'll find, for example, a document about, I don't know, some, some news article. And then the image associated with that is just like a logo of BBC News, right? So that's not really relevant to the text, right? It's just kind of like the logo of the company. So you run into these, I call them kind of like data cleanliness issues, where it's just that because you have such a huge data set and you just kind of automatically scraped it, there's often incongruent images that don't align with the accompanying text, leading to training instability. And the way that they actually uh, mention that you notice this, right? So how do you notice this when you're training? So the frequent occurrence of gradient explosions hinders the successful training. The issue predominantly arises from the disruptive influence of noisy data significantly impairing training ability. So what do they mean by this, right? So you're feeding your batches of training data into your model and you're using your loss function, in this case, some kind of contrastive loss, usually to push a gradient into all the little weights of your uh, model. In this case, you're not really pushing into most of the weights because the vision encoder and the uh, language encoder are frozen. So really you're just pushing gradients into these little projector layers, which are usually something like an MLP or a Qformer, like we'll look at. But whenever you f feed it, if you just happen to feed it one of these weird shitty images, right? Like a 404 not found and then like a description of like camels, 
right? Like the the gradient for that is going to ex explode, right? As they call it here. And what what they mean by that is that the little your little model has been building this little world model, building its own little next token prediction model, and then all of a sudden it receives this piece of data that that says no everything that you have right now is really fucking wrong and you better be moving in that direction and suddenly the gradient's like, oh shit, I better be moving and it just takes a huge gradient step in that direction, right? And that's kind of what they mean by this gradient explosion. So if you don't uh, go through your entire data set, which is kind of impossible to be honest because these data sets are so huge right now, you can have a bunch of these basically bombs inside your data set that are basically just mismatched pairs or things that don't really make uh, sense and that kind of explodes your uh, your training. So uh, that's that. I just wanted to jump to that real quick because I think the data cleanliness issues are important. Okay, observing constraints. Uh, Share GPT four exploits GPT four V for generating one point two high quality image text pairs. So this is something that we're going to talk about more tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to be looking at a little bit more dealing with this kind of synthetic data sets that are generated by models. So in this case, right, you're using some data set that has these image caption pairs, but the captions aren't very descriptive. So one thing you can do is you can literally feed the image into GPT-4 Vision and GPT-4 Vision will describe the image for you. And then you use that GPT-4 Vision description, which is going to be a little bit more thorough and a little bit more descriptive and then use that as the text right so this is kind of like a type of synthetic data data augmentation kind of technique if you want to think of it that way but this is very popular we see it time and time again in these vision language models okay so one reason I liked this paper, so this is the uh, mobile VLM paper, is they, I like these uh, tables. So they have this one, and then they also have this one uh, down here, but it's basically uh, state-of-the-art methods for VLMs, and they have like a ton of these VLMs. So this is a very nice little table. It shows you all these different vision language models. So for example, this is the Lava, which we had a stream on that one. This is Blip, which is a, uh, the Salesforce paper, Flamingo. This one's quite old at this point, so... In pretty much all these VLM papers, Flamingo is used as like the the shitty ver like they claim state of the art by saying they're better than Flamingo, but Flamingo is kind of like ancient at this point. So uh, here, for example, you get the Vision Encoder. So this is the the Vision Backbone. You see Vision VITs. That's what everybody uses now. VIT L. This one's using basically the same VIT as this one here. So. The L is the size, so there's different sizes of vision transformers, much like different size models. 14 refers to the patches, so 14 patches refers to this. This would be uh, 3, right, 3 by 3, but 14 is 14 by 14. Um, 336 is the size of the image, so sometimes I think one of these other clips uses a 224 by 224 image. So 336 is actually the, the larger resolution for these clip uh, VIT or clip pre-trained VITs. Uh, the language model, I'm, I'm call, I call it the language encoder sometimes, but it's an LLM, right? So here they're using Mobile Llama. Here, for example, you have Vicuñas. Vicuñas are basically llamas that have been additionally fine-tuned on GPT responses. So they're basically llamas that have been pulled into that GPT uh, place. And then the cross-modality design. This is the projector. So we're going to see, we're going to look at this Qformer one because it's pretty popular. It keeps coming back up. Uh, linear projection is probably the easiest one you can do, which is you basically just take the features and then just <laughs> linearly project them so that they fit into whatever the thing on top of it is. Uh, and then MLP is the slightly fancier version of linear projection, but it really seems like this uh, Qformer is kind of the one that is the more popular here. LDP, they go into it later, so we'll look at that. Okay. Multimodal Training Corpa. So you can see that Mobile VLM, which is this paper, was trained on Lava 1.5, or trained on the same data set as Lava 1.5, and Lava 1.5 was trained on Instruct Blip, which is the data set that comes out of Blip 2 here. Or not the data set that comes out of Blip 2, but the data set that was used to train Blip2, which is Coco, VG, CC3M, CC12M, and Leon. So this is really the data set here. You have to basically do like <laughs> three different lookups here. It's like a linked list. This one points you to this one, which then points you to this one, which then points you to this one. So this is their real data set. 
Okay. Uh, what do we go here? Okay, let's keep going. Model compression. Ooh, okay. Eleve group has been answered his question. It has been used to study the limitation of large dimensional statistics from random matrix. Okay. Comes with code. Do you think the current generative... Just to not... Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks for letting us know about that, Eleve. Liu question. Do you think the current generative model architecture is good enough to produce better data than the training data? What is the minimum point and method of this judgment? So I think there, I have like opinions on this, right? And obviously I'm biased because I'm someone who literally had a synthetic data startup. So back when I was a young lad, I actually went through Y Combinator and I may, and the, the startup that I founded was for synthetic data, right? So I'm on the pro synthetic data side right but then there's also other people within the machine learning community who don't believe in synthetic data at all at all right and i think the the way that they kind of approach it is like they almost think of it almost like a first law of thermodynamics kind of situation right so the first law of thermodynamics is like uh energy cannot be created or destroyed or something like that right where basically all the energy that goes into a system is basically the same amount of energy that goes out of the system. You can't create or destroy energy. Everything is either lost through heat or something like that, right? There's people who have that kind of mindset for information, right? Where to them, they think that you can't really create or destroy information. Like if you train a model with some training corpus, that model cannot cannot basically be any more intelligent than that training corpus, right? So they almost have this kind of like thermodynamic view where you're never going to be able to use synthetic data to train better models because you're, you're going to always fundamentally reach the kind of like limits of the original training corpus. I don't think that's necessarily the case, right? I think that it, I know it kind of feels weird, but I feel like there is a way to use models to generate data that you could then train another model on that is going to be slightly better, right? So, like, there is a way to to basically generate data sets that contain more information than was in the original training corpus. And, like I said, there's there's people on both sides of this argument, and it's not like one side of the argument is all the smart people and one side of the argument is all the stupid people. There's There's smart people on both sides, and we don't really know yet, right? To me, it seems like the evidence is just growing day by day, right? It seems like more and more everyone just keeps training on these data sets that are synthetically generated by other models, which are synthetically generated by others. So it's like, it seems to me like there's there's something here, right? There's a kernel of truth there. It seems like you can actually pull more information out of a model than necessarily that model had to begin with. So we don't really know the, di the, the kind of like underlying dynamics and the reason for that and it's very case by case and it's kind of like an art more than a science right now and we don't really have kind of theoretical models for what exactly is is the reason for this but I don't know I'm, I'm on the side that there is some kind of way to pull information out more information than is in there Yeah, exactly, Josh. That's a that's a good point. It's like, do you think that if we took all of the if we took the the twenty best uh, scientists in the world, right, best math scientists in the world, and then put them in a room and they were allowed to talk to each other, but they were never allowed to perform any experiments, right? So they're never allowed to actually go out in the real world and perform some kind of experiment. Would they eventually get smarter over time? Right. I feel like the answer is yes. Right. Like at some point. It's like the just the act of going back and forth and, and generating, right? Whenever you generate, you're kind of interpolating and then you can interpolate and then someone can kind of look at your interpolation and there's there's a way to create information there. I don't know exactly how it works. Like I said, it's like there's not really a formal theory here, but I don't think it's kind of like the way that these kind of like absolutists think where it's like some kind of like energy like thermodynamic law where it's like there's literally no way for you to create more intelligence than the model already took from the training data i think there's something there but i don't quite have the 
uh, theory to, to kind of prove my point of view other than just anecdotes. Okay, so model compression for LLMs, we've seen how basically everyone wants to make these language models and these vision language models smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Because nobody wants to just only run things on giant GPUs in some cloud through an API. People want to be able to run these things on a cell phone. There's a bunch of different techniques for making models smaller. We've read a bunch of different papers where people go over these techniques, right? So model pruning, this is when you take a model and then you prune, as in like cut individual little neurons, individual parts. You're basically reducing the overall parameter count, making it more sparse, right? Quantization, this is when you uh, reduce the precision on the uh, numbers. So, right, a model is just a bunch of weights, which is fundamentally just a bunch of numbers. Those numbers have some precision in which they're stored on your computer. Quantization is the idea that you can reduce the precision, right? Reduce the number of bits that is required to store that number. And you can do that. And it's a way to reduce the overall memory size of a model. It's not quite there yet, right? Both model pruning, quantization, and even knowledge distillation, all of those things are going to give you a little bit lower performance. But sometimes it's worth it, right? If you need to run something on a much smaller uh, device, such as an edge device. Knowledge distillation, this is the idea that you basically can train a smaller model to mimic a bigger model, right? So you can have a big model and then a little model, and then you feed an image or something into the big model, and then it has some output, and then you basically use that as a way to supervise the small model. So you feed the same thing into the small model, and then you say, hey, for this thing that I just fed you, you should be mimicking that big model. So then it goes and it mimics that big model, right? And you run that over and over and over again, and you can distill a bigger model into a smaller model, right? And we saw this, for example, with the Segment Anything model, the Segment Anything model out of Facebook. I think within like one month, someone, some random like Korean research group had already distilled it and they called it MobileSAM. And it's basically just a very small little mobile network that has been distilled from the, the big Segment Anything model that Facebook released. Uh, and then low rank decomposition, this is your LoRa's. Uh, and LoRa's are not quite the same. Like there's, they're, they're not a way to make the model smaller. Sometimes you can do like the LoRa plus quantization, right? That's something that we saw where you can use a LoRa to basically make up for the performance negative that you get from quantizing. But LoRa's are more used in general to kind of like adapt and change the behavior in a, in a different direction, right? So they're very popular in image generation with something like stable diffusion to, to kind of change the style of the generated images. Okay. So what else? They talk about VLM benchmarks here. So things like GQA. Anytime you see a VLM benchmark and you see this QA, that means question and answering, right? So you know that it's going to be some kind of like image plus question, and then you have to give me the answer, right? Or And then maybe there's a couple more kind of back and forths. Text VQA. What else you got? OCR, which is optical character recognition, kind of a legacy term, to be honest. I think OCR is a very old terminology, but it's basically, can you read text in images? Uh, MM Bench, this is one that we've seen before, and then MME, so a bunch of different benchmarks for VLMs. Holy shit, you guys are popping off. What are you guys talking about here? Uh, what is the education system but a giant 12-year view of synthetic data? Yes, I agree with that. A great term to encapsulate this is gestalt. Sum is greater than the parts. Isn't Geralt gestalt? Isn't that the the witcher? <laughs> Can be true, but limiting in this question from Nuno, we'll have right now, the AI might find new patterns and find new theories that we didn't see by now, but limited in the sense that the AI won't question. And then Majetti answers by saying, Alpha Star Zero really proves the validity of applying to synthetic data, i.e. human experts. We would just need to do what it's optimizing for. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Majetti, but the reason that it works with something like Alpha Zero is that you you have the actual final, did you win the game or did you not win the game, right? So like Alpha Zero is very good at self-play, right? <laughs> So it's very good at self-play, right? And but the thing is that it's always there's always some fundamental like kind of ground truth oracle that is the game, right? So like if you have 
AlphaGo and it's self-playing and it comes up with some new move, right? And it's a move that maybe no other chess grandmaster has ever played before, so it is unique. But how do you know if that move is any good, right? Well, you know if it's good because eventually it leads you to win the game, right? So Alpha Zero in any of these kind of games like Go or Chess, you can actually at the end of the game say, okay, well, this person won and this person lost. So that's kind of, that's the difference, right? Where it's not the case like that with text or with images, right? Where it's like, you don't have this kind of like ground truth signal coming from actual reality itself to tell you whether what you did is correct. And that's, if you think about the scientific method, that's literally what the scientific method is. The scientific method is basically saying, hey, rather than just sitting here and talking back at each other and, and the, the, the best argument wins, we need some way to basically say, I have this theory, you have that theory. Let's come up with an experiment and let's test reality. And then reality will tell us whose theory is correct, right? So this this whole idea of synthetic data, it goes way back, right? Like the more you think about it, it goes all the way back to like even like if you go back to like uh, antiquity, right? And you think about these Greek philosophers who would just sit there and they would just argue with each other, right? And they were definitely of the idea of that, yeah, you can come up with a greater truth just by going back and forth and using logic to to kind of like back and forth with each other, right? So they had kind of a more of a synthetic data kind of mindset where it's like, yeah, you can you can arrive to the truth by just sitting there and talking back and forth, right? Which is kind of the idea of like, you can generate synthetic data and then train on that in a way that actually ends up being better than the original one. But then the whole like enlightenment kind of renaissance kind of brought in this kind of scientific method where it's like, no, 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 you can't, we can't be doing this bullshit that the monks do where they just sit there and they talk with each other and they argue about arguments and then eventually get to a greater truth the only way to get to the greater truth is you need to kind of like query base reality you need to create an experiment and then that's where you're getting the information from right it's like you're not creating the information from going back and forth you're kind of pulling that extra information that extra intelligence from base reality which you're querying with your uh experiments so i don't know like i said there's it's still not entirely determined there's people on both sides and i think that it might even be like the question that never gets answered right like we might literally just go off into the future never having answered that question okay all right i'm getting carried away guys but that we will talk about that tomorrow because tomorrow's all about that all right uh we were talking about vlm benchmarks uh, of course, embodied AI. So embodied AI is how the cool kids talk like robotics. So basically, uh, once you have a vision language model that can run on something like a uh, NVIDIA Jetson Orange GPU, which is very popular for robotics use cases, then you can basically uh, run everything locally and you don't need to be connected to the internet or running some kind of approved uh, situation because the API provider has all these kind of like safety uh, things that they only allow you to generate and use language models and vision language models within their rules, right? But as soon as you can do it locally, then fuck their rules, right? And you can evaluate whatever you want to do. Okay, so their overall architecture design contains three components, a visual encoder, a tailored large language model for edge devices, and an efficient projector termed lightweight downsample projector. So the LLM just some pre-trained LLM, the visual encoder, just some pre-trained VIT, and then this LDP is really the only, the only piece that they kind of create. Uh, okay, so here, what are they doing? Taking an image, this is an image, right? An image has some height, some width, and some number of channels. Uh, RGB image has three channels. The vision encoder extracts the visual embeddings, right? So it's uh, creating these visual embeddings, which is a series of kind of tokens, right? And there's some amount of tokens, and then each of those tokens has some dimensionality, right? So some the dimensionality here, this DV is kind of like the feature dimension, right? So you can think of it like in a ConvNet, you would ultimately get a smaller kind of encoded image, which would have uh, some dimension H by W, where the HW is smaller than the original HW, and uh, the feature channel is kind of analogous to this DV, right? The hidden size of the visual embeddings here is because it's a vision encoder. Okay, so um, denotes the hidden size of the visual embeddings, number of image patches, 
we scheme a lightweight projector P for visual feature compression and visual text modal assignment. It converts F into the word embedding space with an appropriate input dimension of the subsequent language models as below. Right, so they basically want to make sure that this DV here, the, the dimensionality of the that comes out of this vision encoder uh, for each of those features is the same as what comes out of the basically text tokens. You see this DT, they want that to be the same. They want that DT and this DV to be the same. So they're going to use this little projector here, this lightweight projector as they call it. LLM occupies the most computational memory. We design a tailor, uh, ta we tailor a series of inference friendly that enjoy advantages, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Based on experimental analysis, they're going to start from this one. This is a very popular uh, vision tower, this clip VITL. The reason clip vision transformer, clip pre-trained vision transformers are used is because they're trained on these kind of, uh, both text and images with these contrastive losses, which means that the features that come out of these clip VITL 14s are very kind of semantic-y in nature, right? So it's not like the features that you get out of like a segmentation model, like a SAM, or even something like a Dino, which is a different type of vision encoder. Those features tend to be a little bit more abstract, a little bit more to deal with like textures and, and kind of like background, not background, things like that, versus these features that come out of these clip vision encoders are more semantic -y, which means they're, they're a little bit more kind of like good for text, right? Like they, they're they dealing more with like, this is a dog and this is grass and this is a tree, right? So, and that's the kind of information that you want for these VLMs where you're going to be doing cross attention between these tokens. Uh, okay, Mobile Llama. So Mobile Llama is some small version of Llama, I guess. They use the sentence piece tokenizer. So this is right any language model is fundamentally basically just classifying the next token it's saying okay given this previous set of token previous sequence of tokens what's the next token that i'm going to output and the next token that it outputs is limited to what's called the vocabulary right so you can basically think of it like it's picking one of these 32000 uh uh words or they're like little tokens little chunks of words basically context length is 2k Blah, blah, blah. Rotary position embeddings, RMS norm. Okay, cool. Swiglu. The, the activation function wars continue. So <laughs> there's a bunch of different activation functions, and like people keep trying different ones. So there's ReLU, there's GELU, there's Swiglu. There's like a bajillion different activation functions, and like every time someone trains something from scratch, they always end up. Uh, having a hyperparameter, which is the activation function that you use, and then the activation function that is optimal is constantly kind of changing because it really is just a hyperparameter that is random enough that it kind of is more task specific. So, I don't know. Make sure you sweep over the different activation functions. Okay, so the efficient projector which is this glue layer in between. Why don't we actually look at this, right? So you see how you have your vision encoder. This is going to be your VIT. Uh, this is going to be your mobile llama, right? You're going to feed your actual text into the sentence piece tokenizer. You're going to get a bunch of word tokens. And this is your language model. Your language model, ultimately, it's going to basically predict these tokens, right? The next token based on the previous token. So it's auto-regressively predicting each token based on the previous tokens. That's what your little language model is doing. And uh, the way that they feed the information in there, right, is they feed, you feed your image into your vision encoder, and then your vision encoder is going to produce some vision features or vision tokens, right, basically like this, uh, whoop, like this, right, it's going to be produce, here are their actual little patches, but you could think of them like, think of each of these as being like little vectors, and they're not going to be the same size and dimension as these little text tokens, so what this LDP is really fundamentally doing is it's basically just making it similar to these little text tokens. So as far as this little mobile llama is concerned, these text tokens and these vision tokens are basically kind of the same, right? So the mobile llama just thinks it's doing sequence to sequence, which is what it's been trained to do its whole little life, so it's happy. All right, but there's basically two existing paradigms for this little connection layer here. There's what's called the Q-former and then the MLP projection. The Q-former explicitly controls the number of visual tokens per query to force extracting the most relevant visual information. So explicitly controls the number of visual tokens per query. However, it inevitably loses spatial positional information and suffers from slow convergence. It is inefficient for the inference on edge devices. In contrast, MLP, actually, 
Okay, let's let's finish this and then we'll go into that. MLP retains the spatial information, but it usually includes useless tokens such as the background. And I actually have a problem with this as well, because one of the things that we saw is that uh, there is no such thing as useless tokens, right? In these image uh, encoders, specifically these vision transformers, right? We read a behavior where someone went and they realized that the tokens that come out of these vision transformers, right? they're packing information into the useless tokens. So there's the, an emergent behavior in vision transformers where they can realize when some of these tokens are not useful and they will figure out a way to basically pack information into those useless tokens, right? So I forget the name of the paper, but basically what they found is that in a lot of the background tokens, so tokens that are associated with a specific background patch of the image, the uh, vision transformer would emergently basically use them as a class token where it's like passing additional class information or semantic information not related to the local background part patch right so that's how that's why I disagree with this includes useless tokens such as the background because I don't think there is useless tokens I think a bunch of those tokens are being used in kind of secret ways by the vision transformer that as a human you don't really understand It can use, yeah, is, it can use a question from Josh. It's more consistent to just give it a register, right? Yeah, that, and that's exactly what the paper did, right? So in the paper that I mentioned, they basically say, hey, rather than uh, having the VIT resort to basically packing more information into these vision tokens, why don't we just give it some explicit, basically kind of like empty placeholders, like class, you could think of it like extra class tokens, right, which you see sometimes. I think there's a picture of that here. But... Yeah, that paper basically found that you could just use the extra class, use extra class tokens so it doesn't pack information into that. I'm trying to find it. Is it this one? Yeah, these ones here. So this is the register that Josh Phillips is talking about. This is uh, vision transformers, so showing you how basically a lot of these usually have these class tokens here where basically it can put information related to the kind of class or information of the image higher level semantic information okay but what I wanted to talk about is this Qformer so Qformer comes from this so this is a paper that came out in 15th of June 2023 which feels like infinity ago but this is from Salesforce research and this is called blip2 bootstrapping language image pre-training with frozen image encoders and large language models so bootstrapping refers to the fact that of basically start not starting from scratch but starting from something right Th this is kind of another one of those vague terms in the machine learning zeitgeist that like has a billion different definitions if you go into reinforcement learning it has other definitions as well but generally what bootstrapping means is that you're rather than starting rather than doing language image pre-training from scratch you're starting from a frozen image encoder in large language model so that's kind of you're bootstrapping from these already pre-trained uh, image encoders and large language models. Okay, so uh, let's go here because I think this is the more important part. So method. Uh, we propose blip2, blah, 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 introduces the model architecture. Qformer is a trainable module to bridge the gap between a frozen image encoder and a frozen language model. It extracts a fixed number of output features from the image independent of the image resolution. Right, so the problem here is that whenever you take an image and you cut it into these patches, right, depending on the size of the image, you're going to get different numbers of patches. And you don't want to have, you can't really handle that, right? So basically, they want to always have the same number of vision tokens or little features to then feed to the, to the LLM on top. So the way that they do this is they create a set number of learnable query embeddings. So set number means that there's always the same number. So these things here, these learned queries here, right? There's always the same amount of them uh, as input to the image transformer. The queries interact with each other through self-attention layers. So the queries, there's self-attention blocks between the queries and themselves. And then there's also cross-attention blocks between the queries and what comes out of this frozen image encoder, right? 
uh, interact with the queries can additionally interact with the text through the same self-attention layer so they can inter interact here with the what's coming out of this text of course the text is going to go through uh, tokenizer and so on uh, depending on the pre-training task, we apply different self-attention masks to control query text interaction. We initialize Qformer with the pre-trained weights of BERT, which is a pretty old transformer, uh, whereas the cross-attention layers are randomly initialized. So they use 32 total queries, where each query has a dimension of 768. And this is actually an idea that comes from the original Vision Transformer. There was an It's called like DEIT, I think, or something like that. DEIT. Let me make sure. No, it's not. It's not a brand of juice. DIT transformer, VIT. There's a specific image I'm looking for. Okay, I can't find it. But let's go back. Retreat. Okay. But basically, you're learning these queries that are a way of kind of putting in the tasks, right? So kind of one way to think about what the fuck is going on here is that these queries correspond to like kind of almost abstract representations of different tasks, such as uh, segment this thing, like find this specific thing, uh, uh, how counting things, right? So like there's these kind of like tasks that come up time and time again uh, when you're using text to kind of like relate to an image, right? And these queries kind of will pack all of that. So over the course of training, you're basically like learning these abstract questions that you can then ask of the input image. So then whenever you feed it a new piece of text, that piece of text can kind of uh, be mapped into some specific subset of these learned queries. And then that is a way to kind of like pull out the information that you actually want from this image. Right. I know it's a little bit confusing, but you could think of it like they're basically just learning the common questions and, and different types of tasks that are going to be asked of the image information. So it's like a way of like filtering out all the, because what's coming out of this image encoder is basically all of the image, right? But you don't want to have all of the image. You want to basically filter that and you're going to filter that by basically doing cross attentions with these queries and those queries are learned such that depending on all your different tasks that you're going to be training this on you're going to learn uh like i said almost like different tasks i feel like tasks is not i wish there was a better way to kind of like describe that but that's the word that comes up in my head uh there's three different training objectives, three different kind of losses that they use to push gradients and eventually train these learned queries. So first stage, vision language representation, we jointly optimize three objectives, so basically three different losses which are pushing gradients and those gradients are going down into here, right? So the gradients aren't going into the image encoder, that's frozen. They're not going into the language model, which is also frozen, they're really only going into these learned queries. A set of learnable embeddings to extract visual representation most relevant to the text, right? So the point of these queries is they're basically like questions in a alien language that you can't understand as a human that pulls out the relevant information from the image based on the text, right? So think of it like a, like you're learning a bunch of like mer 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 you know, like kind of questions like that, that you don't know what the fuck it is. It's just like a vector, but that vector, when you do the cross attention with the vision tokens will pull out the information that you want. Okay. Uh, contrasting image. So one of the three pre-training objectives is this kind of contrastive learning where you're basically contrasting image text similarity of a positive pair against the negative pair. Right, so positive pair here means uh, an image and a text that correspond to each other. A negative pair would be an image and a text that do not correspond to each other, right? This is the standard kind of like contrastive learning approach that is behind CLIP. So we align blah, blah, blah. What else? We first compute the pairwise similarity between query output T and then select the highest one as the image text similarity. Uh, due to the use of a frozen image encoder, we can fit more samples. Therefore, we use in-batch negatives instead of momentum queue in blip. And this is another important thing to realize is that one of the problems with these 
uh, kind of contrastive learning setups is that you need positive pairs and negative pairs, right? So uh, here you have a cat wearing sunglasses, you have an image of a cat. You need a picture of a not cat, right? So you need a positive pair, which is the cat, but then you also need a negative pair, which is something that is ideally as far as possible from cat, right? So something that is not a cat. So one way that you can do this is, and this is the simplest way, is use in-batch negatives. And what that means is that, okay, I'm going to look inside my little batch of training data that I have for this specific step, and I'm going to find the thing in that little batch of training data that is a basically the best negative from this. But the problem with that is that you could end up sampling a batch from your training data because the batch sampling is, is, is random, right, where everything is cats. So then at that point, you're basically saying, okay, the positive example is going to be a cat, and then because I got super unlucky and I happened to sample a batch of that just all cats, the negative example is also going to be a cat, right? And then you're going to, th that individual little uh, batch, right, where your negative is actually incorrect, it's going to mess with your whole thing, right? Because now you're going to, that gradient is gonna basically going to be no good, and you're going to push that gradient into your little learned queries, and it's going to mess with your queries, right? So one way that people found to solve this or kind of alleviate this issue is they basically create these momentum cues. And what momentum cues are, it's, it's basically you're caching, you have a separate little cache or queue. Queue is just a data structure, right? You can think of it just like a list of things. And in that little momentum queue, this kind of like pseudo batch, you're, you're storing examples so that uh, whenever you pull your batch and you say, okay, here's the positive example. I have this image and this text. Now I need to find a negative a negative pair. So rather than looking only inside the little batch of data that I have, I'm going to go to my little momentum queue where I have a bunch of them, and I for sure can find a not cat in that queue, right? So uh, this momentum queue, sometimes also called hard negative mining, is a similar kind of idea, but it's basically this problem of like, how do I get uh, a negative to my positive in this contrastive learning setup? Okay. Uh, image grounded text generation. Queries can attend to each other, but not the text. And then image text matching. So this is the three different tasks, and they have different masking here. So masking refers to whenever you are doing any kind of self-attention or cross-attention, you're basically multiplying every part of the sequence with every other part, with the part in self-attention with the same sequence, but in cross-attention with a different sequence. So here in cross-attention, you're, you're basically doing attention between all these queries and then all the stuff, all the tokens that come out of this, or the sequence of, of vision tokens that come out of this image encoder, right? And here, same thing kind of happening here. You're basically doing uh, self-attention between all the text tokens and themselves. But uh, much like whenever you're doing decoding, you have a mask that prevents, basically blacks out or zeroes out the uh, attention to future tokens so that it's only paying attention to the previous tokens, they're doing kind of a similar thing here with uh, masks where they're basically like using fancy masks to prevent information from kind of leaking from one to the other. But okay, that's pretty much it for uh, Qformer or Blip2, which is, as said in this paper, one of the kind of two common paradigms for this uh, projection layer. Uh, okay, uh, to keep spatial information and to minimize the com computational cost, we make use of a convolution with a stride of two, which reduces 75% visual tokens. This is also a little bit sketchy here. So they basically, not only do they, uh, I don't know if they use Qformer here. Do they use Qformer here? Okay, no, they don't. They don't use Qformer here, but what they do do is this projection layer. And because the Qformer the Qformer, you get kind of the lower dimension for free because you 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 only have a set number of queries here, right? The the number of learned queries is fixed so that you can just set that to a small number, such as 32, and you're always going to get the same number of 32 here, right? You're always going to get 32 of these coming out. But uh, whenever you're not doing that, you're potential you want a way to reduce the total number of those and the way that they're going to reduce it is by using a convolution which reduces the number of tokens 
This design significantly boosts the overall inference speed. However, our experiment results that solely downsampling severely deteriorates the performance on downstream tasks such as OCR. And this makes a ton of sense, right? Because if you're basically just removing a bunch of that information through a convolution, OCR is already pretty hard to begin with, right? And if you think about the the way that these vision transformers are cutting up the image into these uh, patches, right? If you think about convolving and ignoring, right, with that stride of two, every other patch, if there's a, a street sign here, you might only have like the first part of the street sign and the second part of the street sign. So if you're trying to read the entire street sign, you're, you're basically missing information. So that's that's the problem with kind of just throwing away some of these visual tokens like they're doing here. To alleviate this effect, we utilize a more powerful network instead of a single PEG. PEG is uh, from this paper. PEG stands for Conditional Position Encodings for Vision Transformers. Let me take a sip here. I feel like I haven't checked the questions. Do you mean the information in the background token makes the relevant information much more precise? Uh, no, generally the background token, the vision encoder, the VIT has figured out that there's a bunch of these background tokens. They're not really giving me much information. What if I overwrite some of the information in these background tokens with uh, information that I do care about, such as semantic information, like, oh, this, there's a dog in this image, there's a tree in this image, right? So the, the vision transformers through training have this emergent behavior that they will learn to basically pack irrelevant tokens, which usually are backgrounds because you have a bunch of background tokens that are all kind of the same, with information that ends up being useful at a higher level up, right? Because any transformer, it's series of, it's like blocks on blocks on blocks of transformers. So really each individual block is trying to help the block on top of it as much as possible by basically extracting the relevant information and giving it the little sequence that the next block will be able to use, right? Okay, but why are we here? We're here because we were looking at this and they were talking about PEG. And then I went and I looked at this paper and it was actually really good. So this conditional positional encoding for vision transformers, 13 February, 2023, which is even more ancient, is a type of positional encoding, but I, I loved kind of some of the, the, the reasoning that they do here. And I, I feel like it's worth going through this. So uh, we propose conditional positional encoding scheme for vision transformers. Unlike previous fixed or learnable position embeddings that are predefined and independent of input tokens, CBE is dynamically generated and conditioned on the local neighborhood of input tokens. So uh, position encodings, what they're talking about here is uh, these things here, right? So you see this uh, position embedding, right? It's basically a little piece of information that is supposed to tell this encoder here, this transformer block, where this patch comes from, right? So you could think of it like it's basically saying this is top left, top right, or top left, a little bit left of top left, a little bit left of top left, right? Like kind of that type of information, positional information within the image, right? But that doesn't make a ton of sense for images, right? It makes a lot of sense for sentences because sentences have a much stronger kind of positional information, right? So like the position of a specific word in a sentence and the specific of that sentence in and the position of that sentence in the paragraph has a lot of meaning because the way that words and sentences and text works there's like a very specific kind of like logical flow right it's like it's intended for you to be reading it from left to right top to down but that's not the case for images images are more nebulous right it's like you don't actually really really care about left to right, top to down, and you don't want to have that kind of strong uh, bias, inductive bias there, right? You want something that's a little bit more translation invariant, right? Which is one of the original inductive biases of a ConvNet and why a ConvNet worked so well is because it has this kind of translation invariance, right? Which basically says that a dog in the lower left corner of the image is the same as a dog in the upper right corner of the image, right? Like no matter where that dog is, 
I'm, I'm interested in the presence of a dog, right? Not the necessarily the relative position of the dog within the image. So uh, in this paper, they kind of make that same argument, right? Where uh, in vision tasks like object detection, we expect the model can be applied to images of any size, which might be much larger than the training images. A possible remedy is to use blah, 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 but it degrades performance without fine tuning as laser shown. We expect that models be translation equivariant, right? So you should be able to move that image around and still have some kind of, the ultimate task is probably not gonna care, right? It's not gonna care whether the cat is in the bottom of, of the image or the top of the image. The output feature maps shift accordingly as the target objects are moved. However, the absolute position encoding scheme might break the uh, translation equivariance because it adds a unique uh, positional encoding to each token. One may overcome this issue with relative position encodings. However, relative position encodings not only come with extra computation, but also require modifying the implementation of the standard transformers. So where's the relative positional encoding? I think it might be this one. Yeah, so here, I think you... Explicit 1D learnable position encoding. I don't know if they have the relative one on here, but okay. The relative cannot work equally well because the image recognition task still requires absolute position information, which is relative position encodings fail to provide. So we advocate for a novel positional encoding scheme to incorporate the position. Unlike predefined and input agnostic positional encodings using previous work, the proposed PE is dynamically generated and conditioned on the local neighborhood of input tokens. Thus, our positional encodings can change along with the input size and try to keep translation equivariance. And this change along with the input size is like kind of part of the magic, right? Where basically you can have weird images and different sizes of images and it still works fine. CP can provide a stronger explicit bias towards translation equivariance, which is important to improve the performance of transformers. And I think they have a picture down here. Uh, yeah, this one here. So basically, this is how the PEG positional encoding generator actually works. Uh, so here you have the actual feature token. So this is the actual, uh, this stuff here, right? So the, the little like pink color here, right? This is the actual semantic visual information, right? The features. And then you have uh, D is the, this this one here is the class token. So the class token is the, the kind of like attention sink, if you want to think of it that way. It's this token right here, right? The one that is basically blank. There's no patch associated with it, but you can pack it with information as you go up this uh, stack of transformer blocks. Uh, tokens on the border are aware of their absolute positions due to the commonly used zero paddings. Here they're they're, they basically take these tokens, they put them back into a height width, so they're basically unpatchifying the image, and then they're convolving a kernel. So the kernel is this little square that is composed of three by three little squares. So greater than or equal to three just means that it's a three by three, right? And they convolve that as if it was a convolutional neural net over that feature space and then get a position encoding. And because you're doing this convolution and you're using padding, right? So padding means, the zero padding means that on the edges of this, right, you're gonna have a bunch of zeros. So that whenever this square is at the very corner, uh, it, it basically, the top parts of that are gonna be looking at zeros. And because they're looking at zeros and that zero is very obvious, right? Whenever, so basically all the stuff here, all the, all the position encodings in the edges of this uh, green brick here are going to have this awareness of their absolute position because they're basically getting convolved with a bunch of zeros, which are what the padding is. So because of that, these tokens know they're on the edge, which means that these ones know that they're right next to the edge and so on, right? And that's how you kind of get some notion of absolute position, but then you also get this kind of uh, translation invariant kind of more local type of position encoding information. So, I don't know, I just thought this paper was pretty cool because they had some of the the uh, reasoning here is quite cool. Actually, why don't we read this? We argue that a successful position encoding for vision task should meet these requirements, making the input sequence permutation variant and providing stronger explicit bias towards translation equivariant. Being inductive and being able to handle lo the sequences longer than the ones during training, so bigger images, having the ability to provide the absolute position to a certain degree, and not just bigger images, but multiple images, right? This is important to the performance as shown. Okay, so 
blah 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 I think it works better these guys might even be the same people so Meituan Inc right isn't that the same exact group here yeah it's the same motherfucker look at this Xiang Xiang Chu is that the same guy oh shit dude <laughs> alright so now we, now we know why this guy used these uh, CPEs or PEGs because he, it's literally the same guy okay mystery solved Right, where are we at? Nine seventeen. Okay, we got some time. We're good. We use layer normalization instead of batch normalization to make training more stable and not affected by the batch size. So uh, these normalizations here is basically this is a pretty basic concept. It comes up everywhere in machine learning, but it's the idea that uh, you want to normalize your inputs, right? So things that go into your Every time you go, you feed a batch of data into a layer, right? There might be some uh, specific parts of that batch that are very big. You can think of like very big value and then parts of that batch that are very small values. If you were just to feed it like that, the very big value would kind of override everything, right? So this normalization is the idea of taking the kind of, you can think of it like the amplitude of all your inputs and normalizing them such that they're all... Uh, centered around zero and kind of have a standard, pretty standard kind of little Gaussian shape to them so that nothing is kind of uh, kind of like much more important than the other things, right? I feel like that's a terrible explanation, but normalization is all about normalizing the different inputs around on different dimensions. So batch normalization means you're normalizing across all the different uh, samples in your batch Layer normalization means you're normalizing across the feature dimension. And here's the picture from the original, I think I think this is the, the group norm paper. Yeah, so this paper was all about, uh, this is the original group norm paper, which is quite old. But this picture is pretty famous because it's kind of the easiest way to understand how batch norm, layer norm, instance norm, all these different norms are related. And you see here how uh, this is a tensor, right? So it's four-dimensional here. They have HW. This is really... Uh, two dimensions of height and width. C is going to be your channels or your feature dimension, and then N is going to be your batch dimension, right? So your batch size. And you can see here, batch norm, it normalizes all the values in these squares so that they're all nice and balanced, but within this uh, uh, batch dimension. And then layer norm uh, normalizes them in the uh, feature or channel dimension. So that's that. In case you guys didn't already know, but I feel like you guys probably already knew that. Uh, since the projector is already very lightweight, we don't adopt recent mobile reparameterization designs. The LDP takes the visual embeddings as input and outputs the efficiently extracted and aligned visual tokens. So here you have F, which is your visual embeddings. Then your PW. What's PW? Oh, these are the weights. Okay, so you're taking those embeddings, projecting them with some, the little uh, projector, activation function, another projector. Here's a residual connection, plus F naught. That's literally what this is here. Oh, okay, point, PW is point wise, and DW is depth wise, so these are convolutions. So this is where they downsample. So here, this stride of two. So that means that the dimensionality here is is getting smaller because they want it to be ultimately small, right? They don't want to kind of like have too many numbers here because they want to run this on a cell phone. Why do they say GELU if they say they use SWIGLU? We use SWIGLU instead of GELU, but then here they say you maybe a brain fart there I bet you what happened is that they wrote this before and then they didn't and then when they ran the hyperparameter sweep it turned out that swiglu was better but then they never updated this equation it's probably what happened okay uh, training Firstly, we pre-train the LLM foundation models on text-only dataset Red Pajama 20 V1, which <laughs> kind of is the best name for a dataset, to be honest. Uh, 
Secondly, we perform supervised fine tuning following Vicuña on a data set of multi turn dialogues between humans and ChatGPT. So, similar kind of uh, two part training. You have your pre training on Red Pajama, and then you have your supervised fine tuning on this GPT data instruction tuning. Uh, they're going to be doing everything from scratch, which means they're training their language model from scratch, and then they're training their vision encoder from scratch, and then they're training their projector. But it's not really from scratch because the data sets they're using are coming out of other models, so you're still kind of getting information there and legal liability there. All models are trained. We apply the same sampling ratio of different data sets. The common autoregressive loss is adopted. And this is next token prediction. And look at this global batch size. That is a monstrous batch size. 5,242,880 tokens. <laughs> Holy shit. And how do they have such a huge batch size? Is because they're doing this in a distributed training setup. And the distributed training setup they're using is 20 nodes, so 20 server racks, where each server rack has eight NVIDIA Tesla A100s. So this is monstrous. It's not like we're not talking like OpenAI or Google level kind of distributed training setups where it's so monstrous that they don't even tell you how monstrous it is. Like, but this is still pretty intense, right? And that's kind of what it takes to train even a 2.7B language model from scratch. So I think part of the reason they keep emphasizing this from scratch is because Meituan wants to have, they want to basically reinforce that it's trained from scratch so that they nobody comes and sues them, right? Like they don't want to go into any kind of legal situation where some American company such as OpenAI is like trying to sue them because they're saying, hey, you trained your model from our model or you trained it from, you initialized it or bootstrapped it from this thing. So they, they keep mentioning this train from scratch but the reality is that that's not actually trained from scratch. It's trained on a bunch of, it's or it's specifically here, it's literally fine-tuned on ChatGPT instruction tuning data sets. So I think there's kind of like a weird disconnect here where like people at the top of the Meituan kind of like management hierarchy were like, we need to make sure that we have a model that is trained from scratch so that it is our model and it's our model and we can do whatever we want with it and no one can tell us what we can do with this model. But then the people at the bottom are like, okay, that's cool, but I'm not gonna be able to fucking do that. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna quote unquote train it from scratch, but really I'm just using the same data sets that everybody else trained it. So there's really no fucking point in what I just did. I could have just taken a Llama 2 model and just trained it, distilled it from that. But I don't know. That's my theory. That's my kind of tinfoil hat theory about what was going on here. Uh, we randomly shuffle the data to disturb the sequential order, which is vital. Since the training process can be intermittently interrupted and requires to be resumed. Here we have kind of the basic images, right? You have the frozen mobile llama, frozen vision encoder. And your fire here means that you're training this little projector layer. Comparison with state-of-the-art mobile scale language models. OPT 1.3b, Tiny Llama 1.1b. These are different benchmarks here. Hella Swag is the one that determines whether or not it's cool. So you can see that Mobile Llama is actually not as cool as Open Llama. Well, shit. Here's your training curves, training loss. This is your pre-training. Yeah, so this is the pre-training, and then this is the uh, supervised fine-tuning or instruction tuning. This is the GPT data set, and then this is the red pajama, which is just kind of generic next token pre-training data set. Uh, okay, so that's the LLM, right? Which they want to say they trained from scratch, even though really it's not from scratch. Then what they're going to do is they're going to train the VLM, which is this vision encoder, or the vision encoder, sorry. Uh, the whole training process comprises of two steps, pre-training and instruction tuning. S similar kind of two-step training recipe here. We freeze the vision encoder, focusing on the training. Subsequently, we fine-tune the projector and the LLM to enhance the abilities. We pre-train on model on the filtered closed caption CC595K. That's the number of data 
points in this data set. So 595k closed caption image pairs. One epoch, which basically means they only trained one time on that data set. That's a little bit unusual. Like this is kind of a small amount of training, to be honest. Like, I don't know, I'm not like super up to date on CC 595k pre-training, but one epoch kind of like sets off like a little red alert light in my head. I feel like it should be like 10, you know? And then they fine tune it on the Lava Instruct 158K data set. Again, fine instruction tuning on a data set that was coming out of some other model that is trained on some other data that probably isn't proprietary. So it's like, this is kind of going back to what I keep saying. I'm kind of like a broken record here today, but it's like this idea of like, oh, I trained it from scratch because I trained it on this but that this that you just trained it on is coming from some other model which is trained on data that is not proprietary. So like, or you know, like at the end of the day, like what, what does it even mean to train from scratch anymore? What does it even mean to own a data set or own a model? It's a giant soup. And this is trained on a smaller setup here, eight NVIDIA Tesla A100 GPUs, which is just one of these nodes. So the LLM pre-training uh, was done on 20 of these server racks. 20 nodes and this one was done on one of these nodes and you end up getting a little mobile VLM that is 1.7 billion parameters and 3 billion parameters so pretty small uh, and then here we go state-of-the-art methods comparison here's the language model that is behind that so here you have lava 1.5 using a Vicuña 7b so you can just see the difference there right Vicuña 7b compared to this one here uses a llama 2.7b the resolution, again, 224 is kind of the smaller image size. 336 is the bigger image size for these clip uh, VITs. PT for pre-training, IT for instruction tuning. So this is like the relative size of the data sets. 665K, 558K. Again, I feel like this is not necessarily indicative because this instruction tuning data set comes from a model which has a much larger pre-training. So do you include that into this? And then here you have the benchmarks. G question answering, S question answering, V question answering, Pope, MME, MMB. And what are we looking at? 64, 59. I don't know. It kind of seems like a little bit worse than Lava 1.5. So it's basically Lava 1.5, slightly shittier, but smaller. Which is pretty good, you know? Because the Lava 1.5, just running that locally in my little local GPU setup, it actually would seem all right. You know, it's obviously nowhere near as good as uh, GPT-4V or uh, some of the, I haven't really used Gemini, but I assume it's probably worse than that. But, you know, for a 2.7 billion or 3 billion parameter model that you can run on a cell phone, like, that seems pretty good. It's basically on par with Lava 1.5. Mobile Llama outperforms other models across nearly all benchmarks. What? What the fuck do they mean by that? The number is literally lower. I'm pretty sure higher is better, so... What the fuck is up with this statement? Comparison... What do we got here? This is the speed. So latency comparison of a small language model on mobile and IoT. 8-bit, so... 8-bit and 4-bit, two different types of quantization. 16-bit and then 32-bit would be kind of the most that you would see, but 4-bit is kind of the lowest that you can see normally. You have Q8, 8, 4-bit. Size refers to the size of the quantized model. Sample eval and eval are measured in tokens per second. Sample reflects the velocity at which the next probable output token is selected. Eval prompt denotes the duration required to process the prompt before initiating text generation, right? So in these uh, kind of uh, inference setups, right? You have to encode the entire prompt before you can autoregressively decode token by token. So I think this sample is the basically the speed for the autoregressive decoding token by token. And then this eval prompt is the speed to just encode the entire prompt, including the image before that. And then eval is the generation speed of the output tokens Total refers to the entire time consumed. Okay, so basically loading time included. And loading time is important, right? Especially for something like a cell phone. 
So for example, open Llama 3B on a Snapdragon 888 at 8-bit precision, takes about 3.4 gigs, and completes whatever this little sample uh, inference workload in 63 seconds, compared to Mobile Llama 2.7B at 8-bit, 44 seconds. So it is faster. It's not like an order of magnitude faster. It's just like 20% faster. How much better is 1.4B to 2.7B? Let's go up here. 1.4B compared to 2.7B. 56 to 59, 54 to, okay, so yeah, you're starting to, it's starting to, the cracks are starting to show here. The 1.4B is kind of a little bit, not a little bit, significantly kind of a little bit more stupid than the 3B, and then the 3B itself is already more stupid than the level 1.5. So I don't know if the trade-off is there, you know? Hmm. Okay, and then you have the same ones here on the Orin, which is the kind of robotics-themed edge compute device. Ablation study. Compare the multimodal performance. As the model scales up, the multimodal performance maintains a gradual increasing trend under the same projector. However, it can be observed that the gain brought by the visual model scaling may gradually become saturated at a certain amount of training data. Okay, so they're saying that maybe you don't actually need big vision encoders, right? And if you're really trying to optimize for the smallest amount of uh, inference uh, hardware required, then maybe you can be more clever about which parts you uh, make smaller and which not. So maybe you can gra drastically reduce the size of the vision encoder, keep the language model roughly the same, and end up having better performance. Our proposed lightweight module re reduces the number of visual tokens from 576 to 144 and achieves performance equivalent to or sometimes better than the baseline. I think this is this is you should be a little bit careful here because sometimes these benchmarks are not indicative of future inference workloads all the time, you know. So just because you're getting relatively good scores by just downsampling these vision tokens on this benchmark doesn't necessarily that that's going to lead to good performance when people are actually using this on a cell phone. Right, because when you're using this, you're probably going to be doing out of distribution stuff compared to this benchmark, which is going to be much more kind of in distribution to what the original pre training and instruction tuning corpus was. Okay, comparison with vision encoder scales. Okay, so here you have big vision encoder, or no, this is a small one. I think, I think G. These the, the 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 labels for these are terrible. L means large, G means gigantic, giant, and then B means big. So is big bigger than large and gigantic? I don't fucking know. Why do they pick names like that? Hundred ninety six. So this one's definitely small. Okay, let's do this one. This one's definitely small. One forty four. Oh, but it's only small because they downsample. Okay, so the number of tokens is small because they're using this LDP to downsample. Versus this one here, you see this is the same vision encoder, but it uses the um, multi-layer perceptron as the projector, uh, which means that you use all of those tokens, 576. You know, that's actually pretty good. Look at that. This is kind of what they're saying here, right? Where even though they're reducing the total amount of tokens quite drastically here, right, with that stride 2 convolution, the performance is still pretty much comparable. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe we don't need all these 576 tokens. Maybe most of those are trash. Ah, here we go. Base, large, and giant. Okay, so I was wrong. It's not big, it's base. But I still feel like there should just be better, you know, they should just call it XL, XXL. Right, because I know that XL is bigger than L, but I don't necessarily know intuitively that giant is bigger than large. Furthermore, we show the performance under different vision backbones. We roughly classify these paradigms into four categories. 
The image enco the vision encoder trained with supervised image text alignment achieved the best performance. We noticed that the model pre-trained by grounding detection achieved relatively comparable performance to the clip pre-trained models. Image level alignment has greater potential to strike better performance than object level, especially by using more visual tokens or more training data. Hmm. So here they're ablating on some of the projector stuff here. It's just hyperparameter nonsense. Conclusion. In a nutshell, we present Mobile VLM, a set of efficient and high-powered mobile-scale vision language models tailored for mobile and IoT devices. In its making, we refurbish, refurbish both language models and vision projector modules. <laughs> they went from saying, we do this from scratch, to saying, we are refurbishing. <laughs> Imagine buying a new cell phone, and then you open it, and it said, this is refurbished. Some person already used this cell phone and got it all gross. To enhance model capacity by training schemes, two-stage training strategy involving pre-training and instruction tuning. The performance is evaluated vigorously on mainstream VLM benchmarks. We believe that mobile VLM will open up new possibilities for widespread application like multimodal assistance deployed on mobile devices or in self-driving cars and farms, AI bot farms that run on cell phones. That's going to be absolutely crazy. Okay. Is conceptual captions not closed captions? Let's see. What is CC in the CC data set? Does it mean conceptual captions or closed captions? conceptual captions. Dataset is a collection of image URL caption pairs designed for the training and evaluation is not related to closed captions or Creative Commons licenses. I don't know. Bullshit terminology. I'm like kind of dyslexic myself, Max, Max Argus, so I, I feel ya, bruh. Like I constantly get terminology like that wrong so you know but terminology is oftentimes not necessarily super useful you know like you want to understand the kind of like intuitive you want like an intuitive abstract high level understanding that's much more important than like a detailed kind of like vocabulary understanding so like I feel like sometimes you'll find people in academia that like they know every paper and they know all the names of the paper and they know all the all the things like that but like there's not really that much use for that. You know, it's like it's not no one cares if you know like the 10 uh different names for like the the techniques that like precluded this other like, like you're much better off having kind of this more intuitive abstract understanding even if it's not great for you know, like, understand or talking to people in a more technical way, right? Because it's like, I guess the vocabulary based understanding is useful because you can say things and you sound great, but it's not great when you actually want to build something new and you have to kind of project your own intuition into some new part of the space. I don't know what the fuck I just said there, but hopefully that motivates you, Max. Okay. So. We blasted through this paper, which I thought was the better of the two papers. So this stream was called Tiny GPTV and Mobile VLM. So the paper that we just mostly went through was this Mobile VLM. The other paper, Tiny GPTV, is this paper. I think this one was just not as good. It's kind of a little bit weird and confusing, but it's basically the same thing. It's just uh, a vision language model for a basically a small uh, compute package. They do a bunch of weird shit in here, which is why I feel like it's not as good, but, you know, I guess since it's in the title, let's kind of go over it quickly here. In the era of advanced multimodal learning, like right off the bat, it's a multimodal learning. So they hit you with a typo right off the bat, just to, just to spike your anxiety. Multimodal large language models, 
such as GPT-4, have made remarkable strides towards bridging language and visual elements. However, the closed source nature and considerable computational demands present notable challenges. This is where open source multimodal large language models like Lava and MiniGPT-4 come in, presenting groundbreaking achievements across tasks. Despite these accomplishments, computational efficiency remains an unresolved issue, as these models, like Lava V13B, require substantial resources. I don't know about that. You can run this on a GPU in your home. You know, I think it's like, yeah, 24 GPU, 24G GPU. Addressing these issues, we introduced TinyGPTV, a new wave model. New wave model. I love that. I'm going to start using that. Marrying impressive performance with commonplace computational capacity. <laughs> I take it back. This paper is is balling, dude. <laughs> Whoever wrote this has an eloquence with words that is pleasing. It stands out by requiring merely 24 gigs of GPU for training. This is the VRAM required for this is 24 gigs you can achieve at home. That's that's a consumer GPU. The you can get like 40 gig GPUs, but like anything above that starts getting pretty expensive pretty quick. And an 8 gig GPU for or CPU for inference. Built upon Phi 2, and this is kind of where uh, this paper is similar in that it's not trained from scratch, right? Phi 2 is a model trained by Microsoft, and it's trained on uh, a synthetic data set generated by GPT 3.5. So again, it's the same thing, where it's like you're training on data sets created by a, a different model that is GPT 5 or GPT something, right? So like... Can OpenAI do that? Can OpenAI sue you for training from the outputs of their model? I mean, I would say that no, you know, because they their model is itself trained on a bunch of data that they scraped from the internet that's not theirs, right? So, like, you have to go all the way back the chain. Couples efficient, effective language backbone with a pre-trained vision modules from Blip2 or Clip TinyGPTV's 2.8 billion parameters can undergo a unique quantization process suitable for local deployment and inference tasks. Our work further fosters development for designing cost-effective and high-performing MLLMs, expanding their applicability in a broad array of real-world scenarios. This paper proposes a new paradigm via small backbones. Our code and training weights are placed at blank, respectively. Okay, so here you have these kind of like benchmark plots where basically each of the spokes on this wheel is a different benchmark and then the performance of them uh, for example Flamingo here this is the performance of Flamingo on VSR and 0 would be bad and 100 would be good so kind of the more to the edges it is the better uh, generally the way these are done it's they're they're kind of shown on the same wheel but I guess they tried to do that and then they, they just looked confusing because all the colors kind of overlapped so they separated it out into different wheels here but really what they're trying to show you here is that tiny GPT-4, which is this kind of yellowish beige color, is more along the outsides compared to something like Flamingo. But Flamingo is so old that it's kind of like, you know, you're kind of like beating on a, on a dead horse, you know, like performing better than Flamingo isn't necessarily impressive anymore. Uh, okay, so again, 24 gigs for training, 8 gigs for inference, freeze everything except for this little uh, projector layer. Blip2 introduced the Qformer, right? So the Qformer, which we saw earlier in the stream, is this thing here where you have these learned queries that are being used to basically filter down the information coming out of this vision encoder uh, via a cross-attention mechanism such that you basically have less tokens kind of pulling out the more relevant parts of the image. This Qformer pattern is what they use here. Uh, here's another typo. Consists of a visual coder linear, uh, this should be visual encoder linear projection layer in a large language model. Uh, they have a four-stage training pipeline, which is part of why I didn't like this image, or this thing too. There's four separate training stages, which is a little bit extreme. Uh, but the first stage, you can see here they're training the projection and then they're also training this little linear layer here, 
which then feeds into the actual Phi 2, which is the language model. The language model seems to be it's frozen pretty much everywhere. But uh, you can see here, the difference here is that you see this LoRa. So basically, what they're training is they're training little LoRa's for the language model. So they, they don't really ever push gradients into the actual language model. They basically push gradients into a LoRa on the language model, right? And in case you guys don't know what a LoRa is, you probably do if you're listening to this video, but LoRa's are low rank adaptation uh, matrices. Basically, you could think of it like a little extra set of parameters that are m much smaller than the original pre-trained weights. So they're smaller because they basically, the way that matrix multiplication works out, uh, the dimension here at the bottom is bigger than this dimension R, but if you multiply uh, dimension D by R, by something that's R by D, you're going to end up with the same kind of D by D that you would get anyways. So LoRa's are basically a way to adapt the behavior of these pre-trained weights in a very parameter efficient way because you can basically merge them. Once you have these little LoRa adapters, you can you, they're almost like a little delta, a little delta of for each of the little weight values and you can just kind of add them to the pre-trained weights here. So if you're trying to train on a small amount of uh, memory. So here, right, they're trying to train on 24 gigs of just one GPU in your house. You know, you're not gonna be able to actually push gradients into the full weight matrices of the original language model and the original visual en encoder. So you're gonna basically push gradients into these little LoRa's and then maybe at the end you can merge them in if you want, or you can have different LoRa's for different tasks, right? That's another thing you can do with LoRa's. You can kind of compose them and load them at train time for different things and so on, or load them at inference time, sorry. Okay, uh, system substantially decreases the volume of parameters that require training stages. You can even quantize, I think they probably do that here, but you can quantize this phi two and then the LoRa in a way almost makes up for the quantization uh, loss in performance you're gonna get by quantizing this. That's something that we saw in the QLoRa paper, which we also read on this channel. Utilize the Phi2 as the backbone. Normalization, so here they're also doing layer norms, RMS norms, right? They layer norm the queries, layer norm the keys. This is your standard attention operation here. I just thought this was funny because I think this is a right obviously these are some of these people are going to be better at Chinese or English than others right I bet you this guy speaks good English because he's at Lehigh but this random person here this is probably some like 19 year old kid from Anhui in China so like that guy this guy probably doesn't have as good English as this guy so they wrote different parts of the paper and I think you can tell right so like look at this paragraph here <laughs> This paragraph is like the most ESL paragraph I've ever seen. It is originating from the Lama 2 conversion template and includes general input. It have six distinct tasks, each correlated to specific task. It utilize, like, like what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make fun, you know, like, I don't know any Chinese, so I'm an idiot in that way, but, you know, I think it's kind of adorable. Adds a bit of levity and humor to have uh, kind of English like that. Warm-up training. What else? Pre-training. They fine-tune it on the lava, so kind of the same thing as this other one, right? Apparently this lava data set, very popular for fine-tuning these VLMs on. I think they also mention it here as well. Yeah, instruction tuning. You can see how here they use the same uh, instruction tuning data set as this Lava 1.5. They're doing the same thing here. Instruction tuning with the Lava, the same one that Lava used. And this is a much more approachable uh, setup, right? So they're training on a single NVIDIA RTX 3090, which is the one that I have. PyTorch 2, CUDA 11. So this is this is like, you can do this at home, right? Compared to this one here, this is like, nobody has this at home. This, these are monster setups. Where is it? Right here. 
eight NVIDIA Tesla A100s. Ain't nobody got Tesla A100s at home. Okay. Uh, 51. I think I'm going to end it there. Let me sip some coffee. I'll summarize what we did. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. And if not, we're going to end it after this. All right, question from Stalin Sampras. Which is the best vision language model? Is it COG VLM or any new developments in the space? So I think if you want pure performance, it's GPT. So GPT is gonna be your best bet. This is probably the best vision language model. The second best vision language model is probably BARD, which is Gemini Pro. That's the second best one. Now, if you want open source vision language models, I think that uh, here, this is a very good table, table four in this paper here, mobile VLM, table four. Here's basically the state-of-the-art VLMs. Uh, this one is the one that I've used, this Lava 1.5. I used that for the little robot that I had. I think there's some upgrades. There's a couple different new ones based on this. This is probably not like super recent. I bet you there's probably slightly better ones now. But, right, because even here, right, Vicuña 7B is not a very good LLM. You could probably train a Lava model with a Mixtral uh, LLM and be better. But uh, to answer your question, Stalin, I would say GPT, then the Google one, and then uh, the third best is probably open source, which is something like this. Cog VLM stomps Llama. Or Lava, okay. Have you seen Mobile Aloha? I have seen Mobile Aloha, and I I think some of it is staged. I have a secret conspiracy theory on that, but... <laughs> Thanks. Hippo. <laughs> Maybe I should call myself that. Hippo. Always look forward to these. I appreciate the love. 87GN. Uh, Anhui Polytechnic University is a famous university in China. Yeah, I've actually... So, I've been there. I don't, I don't want to like necessarily dox myself, but I, I have spent time in Wuhu in China, and I have been to Anhui. I walked around there. Um... Okay. You see any promising time series training papers? I'm not much of like a finance guy, to be honest, so I, I don't really know what the state of the art is in finance. Let's see. What is in time series? Prompt cast? How old is this? TS Mixer? Three months ago? I don't know. I don't know if that's state of the art. I wouldn't necessarily trust this. Anything that beats COG VLM. Let's see. Tell me more about COG VLM. Powerful open source, strong performance. Visual grounding. Oh, look at this, RoboFlow. These guys are actually from the same batch in Y Combinator as, as, as myself. Used in various industries. It's a 17B, okay, so it's actually kind of big though. Cog VLM 17B, like you can't run that at home, can you? How many sizes does COG VLM come in? Okay, so they have a 7B version and then they have a 13B version, but I bet you all the benchmarks are with the 17B version. So that's that's kind of like, that's why it's a little sketch. You don't know if the, the 7B could be stupid. 
<laughs> and they're tell- and you're just kind of using the fact that the 17B is big, but I don't know. It sounds like Josh says it's good, so I don't know. Check it out. Check it out, Stalin. Cog VLM. Okay. Let's summarize what we did today. So today we reviewed uh, two different papers uh, on small vision language models, tiny GPTV and mobile VLM. So vision language models are multimodal models that are combining uh, images and text. And the idea is that there's a whole set of tasks which require both of these, right? So posting an image and then asking a question about that image, or maybe you generated an image you want to generate. So there's a bunch of like tasks where you need to be able to, the language model needs to be able to consume both image information and text information. So in the space of VLMs, kind of what everybody's working on is how do you glue these things together, right? You have a language model and you have vision models, both of which are transformers, right? You have vision transformers and you have just the transformers in language models. But how do you get vision transformers to basically glue and output things that can be read by these uh, language models. So there's a couple different techniques here. There's two kind of paradigms here. There's what's called the Q-former paradigm and then the MLP projection paradigm. So the MLP projection is you basically just have a little layer here, little multi-layer perceptron, maybe just a single linear projection layer. But the idea with that is that whatever comes out of your vision encoder, which is frozen, and uh, you're going to project it such that the dimension matches the tokens that is expected by your uh, language model. And uh, you do this generally in kind of two stages here. The, in the first stage, you might freeze the vision encoder, freeze the language encoder, or the language model, and then just only train, only push gradients into this little projector here. Right, and there's a bunch of different data sets that you can use to do that. And we saw how actually the data sets end up being quite important. And if you're not careful, uh, you can basically explode your gradients, right? So if you have data sets that have noisy data, you could end up causing a lot of damage uh, with these uh, vision language pre trainings. But, anyways, once you do that and you train and you have your little uh, projector, then you can have an additional instruction tuning uh, training stage in which you actually uh, push gradients into your language model. And if your language model is small, as in the case of this paper right here, they have a little mobile llama, you can just push gradients directly into this mobile llama. But uh, generally pushing gradients into a language model like that is gonna be quite resource intensive. In this paper, they have a really big distributed training cluster, right? They have 20 nodes with eight NVIDIA A100s per node. So they can do that, but if you're GPU poor, such as myself, and you only have an RTX 3090, then you can do kind of what they do in this paper where they basically just, uh, they also do this kind of uh, pre-training where you're only pushing into this, uh, the, to these projector layers, but then they uh, also have a second stage where they now push gradients rather into the actual full language model. The full language model stays frozen and they're only pushing gradients into these little LoRa's. So LoRa's have emerged as kind of a great way to do training at home if you don't have these monster training setups uh, and you don't want to be quote unquote training from scratch as they say that they do in this paper, even though really they don't train from scratch. They're just taking architectures that already exist, ideas that already are there, and they're training on data sets that are the result of other models. So they're basically training on these synthetic data sets that are generated by proprietary models. So it's not entirely clear to me that those data sets wouldn't be proprietary. And then by kind of continuing that chain, this model wouldn't be proprietary either. So it's a weird wild west world right now. Everybody's training on everybody's outputs and nobody's getting sued so far, but it could be a different situation uh, a year from now. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically it, right? It seems like the, the state of the art is getting pretty good. You know, like we're, we're getting these very, very small vision language models here. Uh, in this paper, mobile VLM 3B and mobile VLM 1.7B, this is very tiny. You can run these on, uh, here they show you performance on Snapdragon 888, which is basically a cell phone, and then a Jetson Orin, which you can think of it basically like a robot, right? Very small, kind of like a 
robot edge computing device. And it's pretty good. You know, we're, we're, we're getting there. And I'm a believer that we're going to eventually get to like an end-to-end -end situation, right, where you can basically have any task completed by a vision language model that's can, that's kind of running on its own output kind of in an agent-like way. And I presented uh, this paper as kind of a motivation for that, this one here, where we're already seeing that with GPT-4 Vision, which is the strongest vision language model that you can have right now, you can basically browse the web and click and, and do things, right? So if GPT-4 Vision and Gemini are are kind of just starting to get good enough that you can actually do this and you can have an agent that basically goes out and clicks on things and buys things for you or like pretends to use a, a, a website or something like that. And we're starting to get to the point where these VLMs are starting to get very small and you can run them on a cell phone. I think we're very, very close from having basically AGI on a cell phone, which is fucking crazy to think about, right? That we're going to literally have AGI that can see multimodal AGI that can run on a cell phone, which is, I think that's awesome, but safety people are, their brain is exploding right now because there's no way they're going to be able to control every single cell phone. So I don't know. It seems like there's still a little bit of room to go. You know, people are still waffling around. They still don't know what the best way to do these projectors are. They keep mentioning this Qformer, which is this uh, technique that was comes from a Salesforce Blip 2 paper. But I feel like eventually the community is going to settle and we're going to figure out the best way to kind of feed these vision tokens into these language models. And once it settles, I think you'll see a little bit less kind of churn on that particular hyper part of the hyperparameter space. But we're getting close, guys. We're very close. So that's all I got. What else you got here? Takes very long. Top slot. Cog VLM uses flash attention. Qformer did not seem to work well. Okay, so maybe we're already there. Seems like. Stalin is saying that the Qformer was actually shit tier, so therefore we can just close this tab because it's no longer going to be relevant ever again. <laughs> yeah, actually, that is something, right? So, like, they did say uh, here, uh, specifically here. Oh, here? Here? Yeah, here. This is the one that I... So, when they use this MLP projector they use a convolution to to basically heavily downsample the number of visual tokens. So they basically take the 576 tokens that are coming out of this pre-trained clip LP14 S336, and that's 576. They're downsampling it down to 144, and look at the performance drop. It's not. It's like basically the same. So that tells you that you you might not need to do kind of the part of the whole reason for the Q former was that you wanted to basically reduce the number of tokens. So you were learning these uh, specific query tokens that are kind of generic E in order to basically downsample and extract what's coming out of this. But if you can just downsample naively and then do that, get that anyways, then maybe it doesn't matter. So we might literally already be there, Stalin. But that's it, guys. That's all I got. Mobile VLMs, uh, tomorrow we're going to be looking at this. So this is tomorrow's stream, training models with models. Uh, we were talking about this today, but we're going to talk about it more tomorrow. And this idea of like, hey, can you just train a model from the output of a different model? And this is becoming more and more popular, right? And I think this is in some ways the future. And we're going to look a little bit deeper and see maybe what, whether this actually makes sense. But if that's your kind of jam, join us. If not, have a great weekend. Hope you guys have a good year and see everybody later. Mm -hmm.